Welcome to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Co-pilot Pearson and I are having a well-deserved Christmas break from steering the rockets of right thinking. But to help keep you sane, dear citizens of Planet Normal, during this festive period, we're bringing you some of our biggest interviews from our recent archive, the discussions we've had on the flying refuge of reasoned views. Now, back in September, I interviewed former Prime Minister Liz Truss. Since spending just 49 days as Prime Minister back in the autumn of 2022, Truss has placed herself at the heart of a sizeable group of campaigning Tory MPs, pushing for what she calls pro-growth measures to promote enterprise and prosperity rather than an ever-growing state. Liz Truss jumped into the rocket after giving a speech defending her growth strategy as Prime Minister and explaining to us where the government needed more focus. Liz Truss, thanks a lot for appearing on Planet Normal. Great to be on the show, Liam. Liz, you've given a major speech to kick off this week. You're concerned about 25 years of economic consensus taking us down the wrong road. How so? The problem we've got is that Britain isn't growing fast enough. So people's incomes have fallen behind. So compared to somebody in the United States, a Brit is £9,100 worse off. And that problem is getting worse. And I believe the problem is there's too much regulation. The government has got too big and it's squeezing the productivity and enterprise out of Britain. It's just too hard now to get things done. At the turn of the millennium, UK government spending was about 34 percent of GDP. It's now 46. How did that happen and why should we care? Well, first of all, it's not just about the sheer amount of spending. It's also the regulation, the restrictions, you know, everything from the planning system to the net zero targets. There's been so much extra regulation put on people and businesses. It makes it harder to get things done. But also we've seen a big rise in the benefits system, in the welfare state. That's gone up by 50 percent since the year 2000. Plus, we've had all the things like COVID, which has increased the size of government. It's all added up. We're now at 46%. It's the highest it's been since 1975. That was the one year in the 70s when it was higher. And why is that a bad thing? Why does that slow down the economy? Why are you inherently opposed to that when so many other people making up this consensus seem pretty happy? Because ultimately, what brings money into Britain is making things and selling things whether that's goods or services. So the more people are employed by the government, the less of that we're doing, the more it squeezes out that activity. And also all the regulations on those people mean that this isn't the incentive. If I'm paying more and more money in tax, and we know some people are paying a 71% marginal tax rate, that means that for every extra pound I earn, I'm only getting 29 pence back. You know, that is a problem. Tell me what you want to happen now with corporation tax, with planning, with how we run the economy in general? So corporation tax, we need to get it back to 19%, which is what it was before, or indeed lower. We need to make Britain competitive. We want to attract big businesses. And we're now having to give businesses subsidies to come to Britain, you know, whether it's Tata or other companies, because the level of taxes are too high. So we need to reduce the level of corporation tax. We need to make our planning system much easier. If you want to build a factory in Britain, it's going to take you at least two years. Other countries are offering building it straight away. Which are you going to choose if you're a company that wants to open a new factory producing goods? So all of those things have to be made simpler and easier to do. A lot of journalists use shorthand for your premiership. They say you crashed the economy. Why don't you agree with that form of words? You know, the key indicators when I was in office, like the rates people were paying on mortgages, the level of guilt, they've been exceeded since. So none of the things that happened during that period were unique to that time at all. And I think the fact is, look, I know we had to do things quickly. It was important. People wanted change. But at the same time, there was a lot of resistance There was a lot of resistance within the financial institutions and within the wider political and economic arena. People don't like these policies at the moment, even though 
they'd benefit the country even though they help the country to grow. People don't believe in tax cuts or people in those jobs don't believe in those things. So to be clear, you're highlighting, you're not arguing because it's true, that mortgage costs, the, the amount of money ordinary families have to pay to service their home loans is much higher now than when you were in office, even though many of your proposals were reversed or not even implemented. That's right, because interest rates were going to go up anyway. I mean, we've had very low interest rates for a very long time. And that's a problem for the economy because we weren't seeing the dynamism that would have helped lead to economic growth. So I'm afraid central banks across the world were pumping money into the system, helping governments raise the levels of spending. But ultimately, they weren't helping us become more competitive. They weren't helping Britain make more things. And we're now in a position where we've got both the high interest rates, but also the low growth. Former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney took a bit of a pop at you over the weekend. He said that the Trust Administration had created not Singapore on Thames, but Argentina on Thames, a reference, of course, to financial instability. What's your response to Mark Carney and other central bankers who have been less than supportive of your policies? Well, Mark Carney is part of the 25-year consensus. He doesn't want things to change. You know, he is somebody who benefits from government being big because it gives more power to bureaucrats, to people who work in big corporations. And he also wants to pin the blame on me and other politicians rather than acknowledging that central banks made mistakes. And we know mistakes were made. We know that interest rates weren't hiked quickly enough. We know that part of the cause of the rise of inflation was they lost control of the money supply. These are some of the reasons that we're in the situation we're in now. But I'm afraid people like Mark Carney would rather point fingers at others than admit what he got wrong. And you talked about pushback to your policies, resistance to your policies. You've talked about an overmighty bureaucracy. Try and explain the reality of that to people unlike you and me who follow politics closely, who don't know Westminster that well. What kind of pushback are we talking about, Liz Truss? Well, I think this is true across Whitehall and across government. But certainly over the last 30 years, we now have more independent bodies that mark the government's homework, like the Office for Budget Responsibility, like the Environment Agency, these type of bodies who make decisions. And quite often as an elected politician, you find yourself restricted in terms of what you can do by the decisions those bodies make. And those people are not elected. In fact, very few people know who runs the OBR. But these people have a lot of power because they create the forecasts that the the markets look at when they assess a government's economic policy. So I think it's partly about just how big government has got and how balkanised it's got. You know, it's 46% of GDP. That's a lot of civil servants. It's a lot of bureaucrats. But it's also about the governance of that system and who's making the decisions. And as a politician, I was very clear the mandate I had based on our win at the 2019 election. We promised not to put up taxes. We promised to get the British economy growing. We promised people a better standard of living and I wanted to deliver that. But what I found was that the institutions like the Treasury, like the Office of Budget Responsibility, simply didn't agree with those policies. You've complained in the past about a particular leak that came from the OBR of a forecast that turned out to be wildly over-pessimistic, but which you've said forced your hand. Can you outline that? So what happened was there was a leak, I think it was around early October, from the OBR saying that it would be a gap of £70 billion in my spending plan. Or if you kept corporation tax at 19%. Yeah, if I'd kept the package, and the whole package was designed to get the British economy going to attract investment and companies uh, into the UK. And them leaking that caused people in the markets to worry that the government's plans were not fiscally credible. So I was put under pressure, therefore, to reverse 
the Corporation Tax decision, even though I believed it was a wrong decision for the country because independent forecasters have suggested that over time, corporation tax helps bring in more revenue, more jobs, more opportunities. Let's just unpack that because that's quite astonishing. You're saying that faceless public sector bureaucrats paid for by taxpayers forced you by leaking something from their own department, forced your hand as our Prime Minister. Now, I don't know who who put the leak in the press, but the leak was there in the press. There are various parts of the government machinery which do leak, yes. And it was directly the leaking of that that forecast that forced us to reverse those decisions. The forecast which subsequently proved to be completely wrong. Indeed. Before we talk about what you'd like to see, what you want to do, which policies you'd like your party to adopt. Let's just talk a little bit more about your tenure. What would you have done differently? I have to ask you that. First of all, it, the whole thing happened very suddenly. You know, I was in Indonesia, I was foreign secretary, I was at G20 meeting and the most important thing would have been to have a lot more preparation time. I believe very firmly that we need to change our economic policy. And I felt that we had to do it quickly because people had voted for change in 2016 and 2019. But I don't think I had enough time to put together a plan to talk to all the people that were necessary and to recruit the team and the broader supporters that that type of policy needed. Because you know, the fundamental problem here was not enough people supported the policies. You know, we made mistakes around communication. We made mistakes around implementation. But fundamentally, the policies were not falling on fertile ground. A lot of the media didn't understand what we were trying to do. I think the wider political groupings didn't necessarily understand that. And it takes quite a long time. You know, if you look at what happened in the 70s when the monetarists started making their case, it took a long time to get that case through. And you know, we were very short of time. What do you want to happen now? What do you want to happen when it comes to net zero, when it comes to planning reforms, when it comes to the enterprise zones, the reform of IR35, the policies that you championed? So first of all, on net zero, we have to delay the 2030 target. We've got to delay that. And we've got to get rid of the deadlines to get rid of oil and gas boilers. Anything that hurts people in the pocket now we have to get rid of. One of my pledges during the leadership campaign was get rid of the green energy levy. But I think we need to go further than that. We need to get on with fracking so we get cheap energy into this country. And I think it is a massive problem that people here are paying twice what they're paying in the US for their energy bills. And that makes our businesses uncompetitive, everything from seal, steel to ceramics. And it makes our households who were really struggling with the cost of living a lot worse off. So I think we have to delay net zero, we have to look at it again, and we have to say, what is China doing? What are other countries doing? Are we ending up exporting our carbon, which ends up belching out of some Chinese coal plant? That's that's what I think we should do. How about on planning? You're, unlike a lot of people in your party, you actually think we do need to build on parts of the Greenbelt, right? And particularly around London. So within London's Greenbelt, you could build a million houses if you built within a mile of a train or tube station. And I think we've, we've just got to do that. The situation is so serious. People's house prices are so high. The cost of renting in London is so high. We, we just have to get on with that. But also the planning system needs to be completely simplified. Once it's agreed, an area will be built on provided builders comply with building regulations. They should be able to get on with it. The process is far too complicated. I've talked about, I used to sit on a planning committee as a councillor, years of my life I'll never get back. Everybody's just caught up in this bureaucracy. Nothing is happening or getting built. How have we got to the point where so many members of your party, traditionally a centre-right, free market-leaning party, disagree with you, even though polling evidence suggests quite a lot of the public actually agree with your policies. I think that we stopped making the argument. So once we'd won the Cold War, 
once the economy was back on track in the 1990s, I think Conservatives stopped making the argument and we allowed the left, you know, with their sort of climate change uh, agenda, with the, you know, the Occupy movement, the anti-capitalist people, the Extinction Rebellion people, we allowed these people too much airspace. And instead of fighting back and saying what people actually want is to be able to aspire, they want a house for their children to be able to live in, you know, they want to buy a car, we appease them. And we've, we've appeased them, you know, whether it's conservative councils declaring a climate change emergency or whether it's the government legislating for net zero by 2050 without fully understanding the costs or whether it's, you know, the energy the energy price cap and you know, exceeding to some of those socialist arguments. And I think the problem I faced last year is I was trying to make a lot of those arguments late in the day when the ground hadn't been properly laid. And now what I think we need to do as Conservatives is make those arguments again. But we need to make them in the modern context of dealing with the problems we face now. So in the 70s, we faced problems with trade unions and badly run industry. We now face a problem with an overly big state, too many quangos, too much power in the hands of quangocrats and very, very cumbersome regulation that stop people doing things. So we need to make new arguments about the situation we're in now. Do you think much of the public supports you, Liz Truss? If so, who, where? I think a lot of people want what I want. You know, they want to have more opportunities, to be better off. They want their children to have a great future. I'm not sure that every single policy I advocate has massive public support. I mean, if you look at things like building more homes. It doesn't have massive public support, but we need to do it in order to give people the opportunities that they want. So we have to get better at making a case as well as delivering the results as well. And finally, you've been in politics a long time, if I may say. You're very, very experienced, held many big jobs. Your eyes are wide open. You know politics is a rough business. But how did it feel to be basically bundled out of office and to have been subject to so much finger pointing and blame. How do you get through it? I was there for a reason because I wanted to change things. And that was my absolute focus. I did everything I could within my powers. Now, of course, there are lots of things, maybe in retrospect, I think I could have done differently. But at the time, I did what I felt needed to be done. And of course, you know, it's been very difficult. It's been very bruising. But I'm in politics to change things. And that desire to change things has not gone anywhere. Liz Truss, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. A very poignant guest now, who I interviewed very soon after the appalling October 7th massacres by Hamas on Israeli civilians. I wanted to get the view of an ordinary Israeli soldier about what was going on. What's it been like to be a young man on the ground trying to defend your country? And Ben was part of a squad that had gone into the worst affected kibbutzes to provide security for the survivors and to clear up after those who had been tragically murdered. I started by asking Ben what was morale like among Israeli troops and how did he think that the conflict with Hamas would develop? The morale here on the kibbutz where we are with all of the, the soldiers, everyone here is, is focused. Nobody's letting their guard down. Everybody is, is determined uh, on our goal. And, you know, our goal is right now to bring security back to the communities of southern Israel and the Gaza border to make sure that the, the threat of Hamas no longer exists in the, the sense of not being able to commit these types of terror attacks ever again uh, towards Israelis in whatever shape or form that means. Ben, you were deployed to Kafar Azar, and that's probably the hardest hit kibbutz in terms of atrocities. I know it's very upsetting, but can you tell us what happened? I'm in a reserve unit, so all of my guys, we were called up on Saturday immediately once the, the attacks began to take place. And I spoke to a bunch of my guys, and none of us even uh, waited for the call. We just got in our car and immediately reported to duty. Uh, but when we first reported to, to Kfar Aza and we were sent there, you know, we, we were uh, witnessing the body bags being loaded onto the to the trucks and being taken away, 
And shortly after, we started walking around the kibbutz to the just brutal scenes of, of butcher and massacre, complete families slaughtered in their homes, babies slaughtered in their beds, toddlers being slaughtered and shot while they were holding their teddy bears. We you know we can very clearly make out the scenes of what happened by what's left. Uh, we didn't even have to see the dead bodies there to know exactly what took place. No, these acts that took place don't define any sort of positive future for anybody. It was a, a complete butcher and the barbarism that, that took place it must be condemned. You know, I, I think the world did a great job of condemning it in the first 48 to 72 hours of what happened. Uh, and now we're starting to see more more defense of, of uh, Hamas and in that they rep that they do represent the Palestinian people, which I think is a complete and utter shame. You said it was, I was very moved to hear that as the body bags were being loaded into the truck, you were you were saying prayers. The soldiers were saying prayers. Yeah, we for each and every body bag, and there were over sixty of them. For each and every body bag, we all stood and we said the mourners' prayer. And as soon as all the last body bag was loaded, we we broke out into Hatikva. Nobody said to you know start singing. Uh, we just started singing the Hatikva, the Israeli national anthem, which translates to the hope. And it, it really did. You know, I had tears in my eyes. I was not alone. Yossi Landau, fantastic man, you may know, who is the commander of Zaka. They're the body retrieval team. He gave a very moving press conference yesterday saying he had witnessed such unspeakable things. He mentioned a pile of children with their hands tied behind their backs who had been burnt. Ben, who, who are these people who do this? Can, can you, you're a soldier. You must have seen some difficult things. What sort of person could do that? What, what sort of hatred is motivating them? Most of these Hamas terrorists as well, you know, they have families, they have wives, they have kids back in back in Gaza. And I just, how could somebody, exactly what you just said, you know, take eight children, tie their hands together and burn them alive, whole families alive, elderly, and then go back to their families and attempt any sort of life? I, I simply cannot picture or put myself in a situation where I understand the mentality behind it. The only thing I can give an answer to for that is just it's pure hatred, pure hatred of life and the love of life. They, they hate it. They really, really hate it. They pride around and, and promote the fact of uh, being a martyr and dying for their cause. When we go and, and we do eliminate their threat and we take out these, these terrorists, they are happy to die for their cause. They're happy to die knowing that they died killing Jews and killing Israelis. Apparently the, the terrorists had a sort of handbook telling them what to do with Israeli civilians. Is that right? Yes, they had, they had a handbook. They were very well organized. They were very well prepared. They'd been planning this for over a year as many of the documents were, were dated from September and October 2022. Uh, and the, the instructions for them were, were very laid out and organized and clear to avoid IDF outposts, to reach the civilian communities, how many people were located in each home, down to the level of how many pets were located and what they were going to be encountering in each location. The, the weakest points of the kibbutzim and communities for in which that they could break into the communities. It was so well organized. You know, the commanders had these these large, uh, detailed booklets, but every single soldier had on them at least you know one page. And on the top of that one page of orders was the, the most simplest of orders, which was to hunt and kill everything that moves. And that was you know the, everything that they're looking at, and they're always being reminded of you know, hunt and kill everything that moves. I think that just goes to show and some of the true barbarism that took place. I believe you went into a house on, on the kibbutz that had, had belonged to the, to the Solomon family. What, what was there? And, the, and, the, and there was a dog, was there, in the, in the children's bedroom? Yeah, Solomon family. Thank God, you know, we found out that uh, the, the entire family is alive. However, when we did walk in, the, the scene that we saw was, uh, you know, there were bullet holes in the front door. And... It, walking in, I was looking for a place to sleep, and I lo walked into the bomb shelter there of their home, and the dog was there at the foot of the bed on the floor, 
you know, in his uh, in his dog bed in his place. And next to the bed on the nightstand was a 12-inch knife. And uh, my, my heart sank when I saw that. I could immediately picture the scene there of the family, the last line of defense, you know, if these Hamas terrorists were to break break down the door of the bomb shelter and to get in, that that would be their last last line of hope. Looking on the other side, we know that there are, even despite attempts to move Palestinians into a safer area, do you have concerns? I mean, it's a very densely packed small area. Do you have concerns about potentially killing Palestinian children, just as you've seen Israeli children slaughtered? Well, of, of course. And I think that that's something that nobody here ever ever wants to do. We want to make sure that the civilians are as distant as possible from the area of, of urban warfare. The IDF takes every possible chance and opportunity that they can get in order to, to properly distance these people uh, and the innocent civilians from these areas, whether it be by making phone calls personally, individually, to every single family. Can I just pick you up on that? They make phone calls, do they, to individual families? Yes, of course. And I mean, the recordings are out there. The recordings are published and put out there for people to see around the world. And people just, you know, turn a blind eye to it and uh, deny the fact that Israel is is making every single step and, and every effort to to really get these people as far away from the war sites as possible. The Israelis who are serving in the military, nobody here wants to take any innocent life. We want to eliminate the threat of Hamas. We, would, we want to see the Palestinian people rise up and kick Hamas out from, the, from within because, and find leadership that truly does represent their well-being and their positive futures. We, we don't want to see a, a, another situation where Hamas is leading the, the organ, leading the Gaza Strip, uh, both militarily and politically. Because we see what happens. We see that you know the UN and, and foreign countries are giving lots of humanitarian aid to Hamas and to the Gaza Strip, and Hamas takes it all for terror, terror targets. They don't do anything to help the Palestinian people, and it, it's, it's a true, true shame. So nobody wants to see any, any innocent civilian killed. And I think we needed to focus on the fact that Hamas doesn't allow them to leave, takes their keys, takes their IDs, and forces them to stay in the areas. Ben, you're still only 26. You're the same age as, as my daughter. One of the things that really affected me was all the people your age and my daughter's age who were massacred, basically hunted down at the Supernova Festival in, in the desert. What was your reaction hearing that so many young Israelis almost exactly like you, had been murdered? And did any of your guys or friends lose anyone in the attack? I personally knew people who were at the party. I know people who survived and were able to escape. And I also know people, a couple of people who unfortunately were murdered there in that day. I have good friends who've lost their family members, their, their siblings who were there at the attack. It, it affected everybody. There's not a single person here in Israel who is not connected to somebody who lost somebody, whether on the first stage or a family member of somebody that they know. And it, it, it's personal for everybody. And it's something that can resonate with people all over the world. That, you know, so many young people party and go to raves and love to experience these, these type of times. And what it turned into, it breaks your heart to hear the stories. You have, as you say, had support from around the world, but there are lots of critics of Israel. We've seen that here in the UK with big marches, pro-Palestine marches on the street. Do you understand, Ben, that people see this immensely powerful, highly armed country, you know, next to potentially going to evade this poor, densely packed uh, piece of land? Do you think Israel would be responding proportionately if it went in? And, and what would be proportionate for those massacres that we've been talking about? We bring up a good point, you know, proportion. What, what, what does proportion mean in this situation? I think if we actually look at the definition of proportion, then the Israeli army would be marching into Gaza and 
bundling up entire families and burning their homes, would be raping the Palestinians and raping Gazans left and right and before murdering them in front of their families. I think that when we talk about proportion, that would be proportion. And we have absolutely zero interest uh, of doing any of that. Our goal is to remove the and distance the innocent civilians and innocent Gazans from the these very populated areas in the north of Gaza Strip and to target specifically Hamas terror targets and their military facilities and infrastructure in order to make sure that they can't do this again. And they also, we have the Palestinian people in mind when we're taking care of and planning and executing every single act and, that, that we do take out. It's very difficult, you know, you get to, people all around the world have talked about it. What is the proportional response? I think it's a, a terrible question to, to be posed with when after the, the brutal massacre of the, these innocent civilians, we target Hamas and we are not at war with Gaza. We are at war with Hamas specifically. Does it annoy you? I mean, things like the hospital where the international media incredibly eager to seize on proof, you know, that Israel is worse than Hamas. Does that does that annoy you? This in the in the battle of propaganda that Israel is predict is depicted as the bad guy when you know we've seen Israel suffering this unassuageable sorrow, really. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, Israel is the only country in the world that has to defend itself from defending itself, and I think that that is is a very powerful powerful sentiment to hear that you know any other country that would be attacked this way and and faced with a terror attack like this w- would not be questioned twice in their response but because we are Israel because we are the Jewish state and because we are surrounded by the countries that we are surrounded by and the location that we are we come under such a huge spotlight and magnifying glass of every little tiny thing that we do for that reason we take the steps that we take like the, I mentioned before, you know, dropping leaflets, trying to get these people out of their homes and into safe areas. You know, it's our goal also that, you know, that they'll be able to cross the Rafa crossing and find security and safety in Egypt. That's definitely also a goal that we hope, you know, that they can do that. And then we have an opportunity to truly uproot Hamas in, in all aspects and areas of the Gaza Strip. Now, in terms of what it means for after, I, th- I think that's a very difficult question. And both the Palestinian people and the, the entire Arab world must come together and, and help to find these peaceful solutions for new leaders in the Palestinian community. If you do have to go in, we know Hamas has this network of tunnels, presumably booby-trapped. Do you ever feel scared, Ben? I think everyone feels scared just a little bit that we, we don't want to go in. Uh, and just from from the beginning of the conversation at that, you know, that no Israelis wants to go in. I know that if we are tasked with the orders of going in, I know that some of my comrades will not come home. And I think that's it's something to think about, that we don't want to be doing this. But we know that if we must, because it means that our children won't have to deal with this again, then we'll do it. And everybody that I speak to, it's a very wide belief around Israel that we will jump to the cause now if it means that our children won't have to. But yeah, I think that definitely everybody feels a little bit of fear, not wanting to do this, but knowing that not everybody's going to come home. Looking to the future, I hope there will be a bright future. What would you like to see Israel focusing on? I think that Israel needs to continue doing what we've always done uh, in terms of our negotiations and, and peace attempts with our Arab neighbors, that we, we've always been willing to sit at the table. And if it means that we have to make concessions to live in peace, we've always done it. In 2005, we unilaterally removed all Israelis and Jews from the Gaza Strip and gave it back to the Palestinian Authority, who a year and a half later, lost the elections to Hamas. Mm. And since then, Hamas has been ruling the Gaza Strip in their four-year... They won an election for four years, 
and they've been ruling ever since, and there have not been elections since. We see exactly what happens. All of the aid, the foreign aid that comes into the Gaza Strip goes straight to tunnels and terror infrastructure and rocket factories. The fact that Israel supplies water and electricity and gas to the Gaza Strip to this day, I think is a great representation of how all of the money that has gone into the Gaza Strip has gone to terror and has not gone to building up an infrastructure for the Palestinian and the Gazan people. Would you be hopeful for two-state resolution? I personally would, but I think that, again, I, I would not want a two-state solution if Hamas is the leadership of the Palestinian people. I think that we need to work, and the entire Western world needs to band together along with the Arab world to condemn Hamas and its other terrorist organizations, both in the Palestinian Authority and in Gaza and the West Bank, and to denounce them, work hard to find leaders that do represent the Palestinian people and a bright future for the Palestinian people. Because of the fact of the matter is that it's 2023, these Israelis are here, the Palestinian people are here, both have ties to this land, nobody's going anywhere. And as soon as we all recognize that and put our efforts towards finding the leaders on all sides, both sides, that work towards peace, that want to live here in peace, that's when we'll be able to achieve peace. And right now what we're seeing is, you know, Israel, we're ready to sit down at the table 24-7, 365 days of the year if it means that we, our citizens and our families and our children will live in peace. And we haven't had that response from, from the Palestinian leadership. So as soon as that starts to happen and the world needs to promote that, as soon as that starts to happen, that's when we can start to see peace and work towards a two-state solution. Ben, thank you for giving us such an incredibly thoughtful take. I know it must have really emotionally taken its toll, the events of the last days. We wish you in the coming days that you have whatever it takes. You sound such an impressive person to me. And Ben, may your God go with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. I appreciate you having me on and uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you.